The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. Hi there and welcome to Grace in Focus, the radio and podcast ministry of the Grace Evangelical Society. This week there is a special treat in store as we listen to an audio biography of Zane Hodges as remembered by Bob Wilkin and Steve Elkins, a week-long conversation about the life and influence of this scholar, but yet this humble and godly man, Zane Hodges. Our website is faithalone.org. Go there and find all of the resources that we have to offer, many, many articles, some e-books, blogs, videos, books, and our magazine, faithalone.org. That's at faithalone.org. We will say more about it at the end of this broadcast. But right now, we begin the story of Zane Hodges with Bob Wilkin and Steve Elkins. We're going to talk about a good friend of ours, Zane Hodges, and the interactions that we had with Zane Hodges over the years. Now, you went to Dallas Seminary. What years were you at DTS? 78 through 84. When did you come into contact with Zane Hodges? What point in your seminary career? An interesting question. It was actually just before seminary. Zane had come and spoke to the Young Life staff, yeah. and he had talked about Hebrews and the inheritance and the Metacoy. And at that time, I was Calvinistic enough, though I did believe in eternal rewards, but I was Calvinistic enough to think, that's the stupidest stuff I've ever heard of in my <laughs> life. Whoever this Zane Hodges guy is, I sure know a lot more than he does. Yeah. So that was kind of my first uh, experience and of that hearing was about him. while you were in college. Right. That would have been around 76 or 7. So you graduated from SMU, you got into Dallas Seminary, and you started in what, 78 right, then? Same right. year I started. That's right. And the end of that year, I sat in on a class by Craig Glickman on eschatology. I just sat in on it the last day. And at the end of it, he said to the students there, and I think you were in the class, Bob, he said, some of us younger professors think you need to take Zane Hodges for whatever you can. We think he's the best exegete and intellect or whatever he said at the seminary. And so since Craig was somewhat a hero to me through Young Life and all, and he was a very smart guy, I thought, well, Hodges must really be neat if Craig Glickman says that about him. So... The next spring, I think it was, I took Hodges for the elective in the book of Hebrews, which to my knowledge has been the greatest, biggest, whatever elective ever at Dallas Seminary. Yeah, and not an easy class. Not an easy class. I've got a funny story on that in just a second. But real quickly, if I could share a personal story. I was a young life leader at North Mesquite High School. I was exposed to some Calvinistic teaching at the time. I didn't believe in limited atonement or anything like that. I did toy with the idea that maybe we don't have free will and I didn't know for sure about regeneration preceding faith and things like that. At any rate, I was confused enough, sadly, that one week at Young Life, I'd tell the kids, eternal life's a free gift, no strings attached, faith plus nothing. But the next week, I'm ashamed to say that I said to the kids, now, if you're a practicing sinner, you know, if you're sleeping with your girlfriend or if you're an alcoholic or something like that, then you're not a true believer. It was like God hit me with a baseball bat because that night and definitely that week, I realized these two messages both can't be true at the same time. One or the other might be true. They both might be false. But I lost the beautiful assurance I'd had from the John 3.16 message that I'd had ever since I was five years old. But worse than the anguish of losing one's assurance was the fact that here I am. I'm in seminary. I'm hoping to be in the ministry I'm training, supposed to train young life leaders on how to share the gospel, and I'm supposed to be sharing the gospel with kids, and I'm not clear on it myself. Yeah. And the guilt of that was horrific, and I remember praying to the Lord, and it's just at that time, that very week, that I have Hodges for the, wow. the Hebrews class. And so right after the first class, I go up to him, I say, Professor Hodges, there are two passages that are giving me a tough time, First Corinthians 6, that says, no unrighteous person, no immoral person, fornicator, adulterer, etc., shall inherit the kingdom of God. And real quickly, he cleared that up by just saying, Steve, if I'm in your house, that's one thing. If I've inherited your house, that's completely different. Right. He explained that the inheritance is a full-blown New Testament doctrine, even in the Old Testament for that matter. And little did I know, the whole book of Hebrews, the rest of that semester, was all about the inheritance. So that cleared up that passage. The other passage, as I kind of alluded to in the message I was sharing with these kids, was First John 3, 6 and 9, that says, no one who is born of God 
practices sin. No one who abides in him practices sin. At least that's the translation of the NIV, New American Standard, etc., which right. most of us were using back then. And so Zane cleared that up for me. He said, Steve, a Greek present tense, modern scholarship has shown, cannot have a practicing continuing nuance to it unless it has a qualifying word with it. So the King James translators and New King James were actually correct in translating it, no one who is born of God sins, no one who abides in him sins. Now you still have a problem because at the very beginning of the book, he says, as believers, we still sin. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. Or at the end of the book, the fact of the matter is a Christian could sin so much as to sin unto death. Absolutely. So how do you match that with saying that no one who is born of God sins or no one who abides in him sins in an absolute and sense? And you're in the course on Hebrews getting an <clears throat> explanation of First John right. 3, and this, yeah, 6 exactly. and 9. Yeah. And this is after class, and he's just answering it very quickly. But what he said was, and this is in the gospel under siege as well, as a a believer, the new nature itself is sinless, and it can't sin. So when we do sin as believers, and we do, says John, then the way we need to view it is like Paul says in Romans 7, it's no longer I who do it, but sin which indwells me. Okay, well, that made sense. And then he says, and abide, no one who abides in him sins. Well, that's a fellowship term in the upper room and in 1 John And so insofar as we abide in what John has just called the sinless, pure person, Jesus Christ, insofar as we abide in him, we don't sin. And insofar as we're sinning, we're not abiding in him. So that made total sense. Bob, immediately, like that very second, my assurance came back because I just took Zane's words at face value. He was such a great scholar. And I have been a free grace advocate ever since. So it was like a week or two where you lost your assurance and then you got it back and have kept it. Exactly. And I would like to say glory to the Lord, too, because there have been five or so major junctures in my life where I was really perplexed about a problem, whether we have free will or not. That was one of the things. And the Lord just answered my prayers. I believe he certainly answered my prayer in sending Zane Hodges my way. Later, Zane ended up becoming... I would consider my very best friend in life next to Jesus and my wife, of course. Right. And I know you could say the same and many could say the same about Zane. That's how he made you feel. And I just thank the Lord for it. Another funny story about the Hebrews class is this. You'll remember that there are 13 chapters in Hebrews. And one of the assignments was that we had to translate a chapter a day for those first 13 days of class. Well, there are a bunch of hapax legomenas in Hebrews. That means one-time usages. (laughs) So even if you're an expert in Greek, you're not going to have these words in your vocabulary. So you have to tediously look up all these words. Plus, I wasn't a big Greek scholar at that time, not that I am now. So I would spend an hour and a half, sometimes even two hours, every day after class trying to translate for the next passage. So I'd put in an hour, 15, hour and a half. I never did finish them. I'd, so in our login, the next day, you said whether you finished the assignment. And I would always say four-fifths done, three-fourths done, two-thirds done. Now, in that class, there were two grades. You'll recall this. There was the exam and a paper. I made an A on the exam and an A- minus on the paper. At the bottom of the exam, at the end of class, Zane wrote, Steve, I've got you down for an A and an A minus, but I regret to inform you that I have to give you an F for the class because of the missed assignments. What? I told Zane about this, you know, maybe 10 years later at lunch one day, and he got the biggest laugh out of that. He said, I did that to you? (laughs) I wasn't a great student in college, but I made virtually straight A's in seminary, and I have this one F on my transcript. It's so funny, and yet I learned more in that class than probably all of my seminary combined. Mind. Now, you majored in systematic theology, right? That's right. So Zane Hodges was not one of your primary professors. No, but he was a primary professor to me in that I did my thesis on current issues concerning Lordship Salvation. Craig Glickman was in the theology department, so he was my reader for it. But the thesis was from sitting hour after hour in Zane's office getting personally from him, you know, those difficult passages like what's it mean to bear fruit, a tree bears good fruit or bad fruit, or what is it about these false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, things like that. Romans 10, 9 and 10, James 2, Hebrews, etc. All of that's in my thesis, but it was basically regurgitating what Zane had told me in his office. For instance, I remember on Romans 10, 9 and 10, him giving me the whole big stack of his Roman notes. It's about an inch thick. And the thesis was essentially Zane Hodges answering these current issues on Lordship Salvation. And that's what it was, even though he was the New Testament department, not theology. You know, I hear stories like yours 
and I was another one, where Zane was looking every year for maybe one or two young men that he could mentor. And those guys he would pour more time into. Mm -hmm. I mean, you didn't just meet him in class. I mean, you would get together with him for lunch and stuff, too, while you were in seminary? Absolutely. Even in seminary and, of course, the hours for getting my thesis together that were in his office. But after seminary, hopefully we'll talk about this in a later program, I would have lunch with him every month, at least once, and then be on the phone with him some in addition to it. We go to baseball games together and things right. like that. And I so did that too. He really was, as I say, a very dear friend. I was blessed to be a pallbearer in his funeral, and I'm so proud of that. But he was the greatest guy I've ever met. One of the best presentations that I've ever heard, it was probably Zane's last paper that he presented at GES on the Upper Room Discourse. Oh, yeah. And in it, he suggested that John might have used... Plato's the Fido is a template for now, the upper room. Now, that's not F-I-D-O. Right. That's P-H-E-D-O. <laughs> that's right. So it, what it is, essentially, is Plato's tribute to Socrates, and it was these two characters, Echocrates and Crito, when, who spent time with Socrates as he's about to die. At the end of it, after Socrates dies, Crito says, Such was the end of our comrade, a man, talk about Socrates, who we would say was of all those we have known the best, he was the wisest and most upright. Wow. And when Zane passed away, I felt the same way. He was the wisest, best Christian, most gentle man I'd ever been around. And for about 10 days after his death, every time I thought about him, I'd just cry. And, you know, his point at that conference was that the evangelistic purpose of John's gospel was not contradicted by John 13 through 17. Exactly. His point was that it would help an unbeliever to know how this Jesus Christ died. Yeah, in contrast to Socrates, who didn't know where he was going. Jesus knew full well where he was going. And he was telling his followers where they were going. And, And so I thought it was a powerful point because John 20, 30, many other signs he did, but these are written that you may believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. So he's clearly speaking to unbelievers and writing to unbelievers. Zane's yeah. discussion was fantastic. His point was the upper room didn't leave his purpose at all. It stuck with his main purpose. Well, thanks, y'all, and keep grace in focus. Zane Hodge's book, The Gospel Under Siege, A study about faith and works intention is being offered this month to Grace and Focus listeners and available right now at half price through June the 30th when you use the discount code word SIEGE, S-I-E-G-E. Find this special offer at faithalone.org. Did you miss an episode of Grace and Focus that you really wanted to hear? Just come to faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. We have all our past episodes right there on the site. In addition, we have all kinds of free resources available for you. It's all designed to help you mature and grow in your understanding of Scripture. So come visit us at faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. On this program, we keep our requests for financial partners to a minimum. But if you are interested in becoming a financial partner with Grace in Focus, You can find out how to do that at faithalone.org. Our team is really great about answering questions, comments, and feedback. If you've got some, we hope to hear from you. Let me give you our email address so you can do just that. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. On the next episode, we continue our audio biography of Zane Hodges. Please join us. This is the Grace Evangelical Society. Until next time, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.